It was a warm summer night in 1963. She was at a dance with some friends. Then she decided to walk over to her boyfriend's house. She never made it. Just steps away from his home, she was murdered. While her friends continued to dance, while neighbors were out socializing in their backyards, while people were strolling down the sidewalks, someone decided to end her life in the shadows of the night. Who killed 15-year-old Patricia Rebholtz? On August 9, 1963, Officer Jack Leach drove slowly through the small suburban neighborhood of Green Hills, Ohio. Leach's headlights drew his attention to a light-colored form in the vacant lot of Alphonse Udry. He stopped his patrol car and grabbed his flashlight. At 5.07 a.m., he crossed the dewy grass, each step filling him with dread. Lying on her side near a fence line, was the body of 15-year-old Patricia Ann Rebholtz. The skirt that she had worn to the dance was bunched up around her waist. Her crisp white blouse was now mostly crimson. Her purse lay undisturbed at her side with a strap still around her arm. Patricia's blonde hair and the grass beneath it were drenched in blood. Officer Leach had been looking for Patricia since 1 a.m. when she was reported missing. How could something so violent have happened in the peaceful village of less than 5,000 residents? A place where everyone came to raise their children. A refuge away from the big city life. Why would someone bludgeon a young girl to death? Was it someone passing through? or was the killer from the village of Green Hills. Leach notified Chief John Baldwin and Patrolman Randolph Morgan. Within minutes, the investigation into Patricia's murder began. Authorities made the difficult phone call to Patricia's father, Mel Rebholtz, and told him of their discovery. Mel rushed to the scene. Officers asked Mr. Rebholtz to identify Pat through the contents of her purse, but Mel was unable to do so. Officers hesitantly pulled back the blanket that covered her body, and Mel Rebholtz confirmed that it was Patricia. Neighbors watched as Mel beat his fist on a patrolman's car, screaming, No, no, no. Patricia Rebholtz was a sweet, friendly freshman cheerleader that was loved by all who knew her. Patricia's family couldn't imagine who would have wanted to kill their little girl. The day of the murder, August 8th, Mel had chauffeured Patricia around the small village and didn't notice anything amiss. It had been an ordinary day, and Pat was looking forward to the weekly dance. Mr. and Mrs. Rebholtz had no inkling of what was about to happen to their daughter. The timeline of events that day goes like this. 10.30 a.m., Pat and her father leave their home at Daly Road. Mel drops Pat off at the Green Hills High School for cheerleading practice. 11.45 a.m., Pat leaves practice and walks to the drugstore in the Green Hill Shopping Center. 12 p.m., Mel picks up Pat at the drugstore and they go home for lunch. 2 p.m., Pat's brother Mel Jr. drops her off at her friend Janet Mars' house at Burley Circle. 5.30 p.m., 
Pat's father Mel picks her up after he finishes work and the two head home for dinner. 7.30 p.m. Mel drives Pat over to her best friend Beth Upton's house on Latina Drive. The two girls walked about three quarters of a mile to the weekly teenage dance at the American Legion Hall on Winton Road. 7.50 p.m. Pat and Beth Upton are seen by the Green Hill School Board officials walking past the board's office towards the American Legion Hall. The school board held an 8 p.m. meeting and their members included Pat's father, Mel. 9.30 p.m., Beth Upton and several friends are going to leave the dance for a trampoline party, and Pat decides not to join them because she doesn't have shorts. Pat calls her boyfriend, Michael Waring, asking if she can come over to his home at 6 Ilona Drive. The call was taken by Michael's sister, Cheryl. 9.35 p.m., Pat walks out of the American Legion Hall and walks along Winton Road towards Ingram Road. Between 9.45 and 11.40 p.m., Jeff Crusher, age 16, of Hadley Road, drives four times by the spot where Pat's body was later found. He says he saw nothing strange on Jennings Road. Between 9.40 and 10 p.m., Mr. and Mrs. Ray Schreier of 341 Ingram Road and a guest at the Schreier home leave their backyard patio where they had been all evening. They go to the home of Carl Knoll of 345 Ingram Road. While on the patio, they reported hearing nothing unusual. The patio is about 40 yards from where Pat's body was found. 9.45 p.m., Craig Smith, age 15, of 208 Ireland Avenue, walks along Jennings Road on his way home after working from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. at a doctor's office in the Green Hills Shopping Center. Craig passes the empty lot where Pat's body was found. He sees two figures, one kneeling and the other laying on the ground. Craig says the kneeling figure looks at him and Craig could see the whites of their eyes. He can't identify the figures as male or female and walks on thinking that they are the people of the nearby house. 9.45 p.m. Mr. and Mrs. Harry Eckstein are driving down Jennings Road. They see two people on the ground in the Udry side yard, one straddling the other. They slowed their car, but after seeing Craig Smith casually walking by, they assumed it was just some kids playing around, and they drive on. Mr. Eckstein later told police that the one on top was wearing a white shirt and dark pants. 9.55 p.m., Michael Waring's sister Cheryl and three teenage friends, Raymond St. Clair, Steve Tillett, and Tom Bade, drove from the Waring's home in St. Clair's car to get something to eat in nearby Finneytown. They drove through Jennings Road but saw nothing. Michael stays behind to wait for Pat. 9.58 p.m., Pat's boyfriend Michael walks out of his house towards Ingram Road looking for Pat. He goes along Jennings Road but sees nothing and returns home. 10.30 p.m., Cheryl and her friends return home from Finneytown. Again, driving down Jennings Road, they see nothing. 11 p.m., Mrs. C.D. Fredrickson of 1 Jennings Road stands in her driveway chatting with a friend. They are about 25 yards away from the spot where Pat's body was found, but said they saw nothing. 2.30 a.m., an all-Hamilton County Bulletin is broadcast over police radio regarding Patricia's disappearance. 5.07 a.m., Patrolman Leach drives over Jennings Road and notices something in his headlights. Leach discovers Pat's lifeless body. While Pat was being murdered, neighbors are walking by, 
friends are on their patios engaged in conversations. Some are driving slowly by the scene, and yet everyone innocently believes nothing is going on. This was Green Hills, and surely nothing of this magnitude could ever happen here. After thoroughly investigating the crime scene and receiving the coroner's report, authorities concluded that this is what likely happened to Patricia Rebholtz. The Thursday crowd at the Legion Hall was larger than usual. Many new kids from outside the Green Hills area attended the dance. Pat and her friends got bored and split up. Beth Upton and several friends went to her boyfriend's house. A close friend of Pat's would testify decades later that Pat went to Michael Waring's house to break up with him. Pat left the hall and walked down Winton Road and then turned left on Ingram Road. She then walked down Ingram and turned left on Jennings. That's about 300 feet and ends at the intersection of Japonica and Elona. The attack took place in an empty lot across the street from Michael's house. The walk from the Legion Hall takes no more than 10 minutes. The moon was full, but Jennings was dark with no street lights. This is a picture of Michael's home at night, and the only thing that Pat could have clearly made out as she walked down the sidewalk. Investigators believe that when Pat got midway on Jennings, she either decided to cut across Udry's corner lot or she was lured in. The assailant first punched Pat in the jaw, breaking off her front tooth. The tooth was found in the grass about 25 feet off the sidewalk along Jennings Road. Investigator Donald Rodney said the punch would not necessarily have left a cut on the assailant's fist. Pat would have been dazed after being punched. Bruises on Pat's throat show that she was strangled until she fell unconscious. The assailant dragged Pat by her ankles further into the vacant lot, coming to rest by the fence. This report shows the actual location of Pat's body. The assailant used a piece of fence post to bludgeon her to death. The weapon measured five inches in diameter and was two feet long. Authorities found it 15 feet from Pat's body. The post was covered in her blood with pieces of Pat's hair and flesh. Mr. Udry told officers he had sawed off the top of the post and propped it up against a tree in the yard several years ago. Coroner Dr. Frank B. Cleveland gave the following details in his report. Pat was wearing white moccasins, a flowered skirt, and a white blouse. She was lying on her left side with her feet against a fence. The time of death was between 9.30 and 10.15 p.m. The bluish bruises beneath the chin indicated that Pat was most likely seized from the rear and choked to unconsciousness and then dragged 25 feet to a fence line. She was bludgeoned with a fence post so violently that it drove her head into the ground, making a depression. The shattered pieces of her skull had been driven into her brain. Pat had deep holes in her right forehead and right temple. Some of her ribs were also broken. Dr. Cleveland went on to state in his report that Pat had been dead long enough that the body muscles had stiffened he ended by adding that there were no signs that she had been sexually assaulted. Pat's body was just 50 yards from her boyfriend Michael Waring's home, so of course authorities were eager to question the 15-year-old about his relationship with Pat and determine just exactly where he was when the murder occurred. Michael and Pat started dating in May of 1963, the football player and the cheerleader seemed like the perfect couple, but the relationship was far from perfect. There were petty arguments between the two of them, and Michael would often embarrass Pat in front of her friends and make her cry. Friends of the teenage couple stated that both of them occasionally saw other people. 
Michael didn't like Pat's friends and never approved of her going to the local dances alone. Close friends of Pat said that she had had enough of Michael and that she was interested in another boy. Michael was questioned several times in the weeks following Pat's murder. Authorities drew his blood and subjected him to three polygraph tests. Michael's parents, Arthur and Don Waring, believed in their son's innocence and let investigators question him without an attorney present. In 1963, Miranda rights had not been established, and Michael's parents were never present during the several hours of questioning. During Michael's first interview, he stated that he had been in the basement playing ping pong with his friends. After Pat called, I went upstairs to get cleaned up. When I thought it was about time for her to show up, I started looking out the window. Michael became concerned when Pat didn't show up by 10 p.m. and went looking for her. Michael said he cut through the yard where Pat's body was later found and went to the intersection of Ingram and Jennings to look for her. Seeing no sign of her, he returned home thinking her brother Mel Jr. probably picked her up at the drugstore where she usually caught a ride home on Thursday nights after the dance. Michael said he watched TV with his mom until his sister and friends returned from Finneytown at 10.30 p.m. He said he was playing cards until 12.40 a.m. when Mrs. Rebholtz phoned to ask if he had seen Pat. At 1.15 a.m., Mr. Rebholtz arrived to talk to him about Pat. Michael stated that Mel Jr. stopped shortly afterward to pick him up so the two of them could search around the Legion Hall and the yards east of there. Less than 30 minutes later, Michael said he had to return home because his mother would be upset. As the case against Michael began to mount, investigators were dealt a shocking blow. On September 1, 1963, a juvenile court judge called off the investigation. Judge Benjamin Schwartz said that Michael, who was just 15, had been questioned so often by the police that any statements he had given would not be admissible in a trial. Judge Swartz then declared Michael a ward of the court, effectively taking custody of him. Two weeks later, Schwartz sent Michael to a North Carolina military academy for the next two years. Prosecutors weren't done with Michael Waring. On May 2nd of 2000, a grand jury indicted Michael on second-degree murder charges. 37 years after the murder of Patricia Ann Rebholtz, 54-year-old Michael would now be tried for her murder. For the first time, the following details were revealed at Michael's trial. New DNA testing of the clothes that Pat and Michael were wearing at the time of her murder came back inconclusive. The evidence had deteriorated and most of it had been damaged in a flood where it was stored. In 1965, coroner's investigator Wilbert Stegenhorst drafted a report for Green Hills Police. The report noted the following. Michael had first denied meeting Pat on the night she died but later told police he waited for Pat in the vacant lot. When he saw her, he whistled and she walked toward him. He thought it was possible that she may have made a remark and hit her and knocked her down. Michael said, I feel certain in my mind that there is a possibility I killed Patricia Rebholtz. The real me would not strike a girl. I still can't help but feel my other self undoubtedly did it. Michael's attorney said that Stegenhorst repeated psychobabble of a naive and foolish teenage boy that he had heard secondhand from others and never verified. The attorney went on to say if Michael had actually confessed to the murder, they would have arrested him. Eyewitness reports mention other suspects that police never followed up on. Johnny Clotter told police that he saw four or five boys loitering on the sidewalk near the intersection of Elona and Jennings Road. 
He said he knew most of the boys in the area, but didn't recognize these boys. Barry Hatfield said he saw a boy follow Pat down Ingram Road. He walked about 50 to 75 feet behind her. His hair was slicked back and he wore glasses with chrome earpieces. Bonnie Davis reported walking down Ingram that night and 16-year-old Robert Goodballet snuck up on her and frightened her so much she ran home. Prosecutors argued that Michael gave conflicting explanations for a fresh cut he had on his wrist the morning after Reb Holt's body was found. Steve Tillett, who was with Michael the night of the murder, stated in a 1963 police interview that when he left with the others to get burgers that night, he saw Michael through the picture window when he was getting in the car. Tillett then changed his testimony during the trial and said he never saw Michael. This was very important because if Tillett had seen Michael in the window, then saw Craig Smith at the corner who had just walked past the two figures in the vacant lot, then Michael could not have murdered Pat. Michael's attorney stated to the jury that even though newspapers reported that Pat's blood was found on Michael's pants, there was no official record of it in the case files. After the county prosecutor and Waring's defense attorney each presented their case to the jury, made up of seven women and five men, they deliberated for almost 12 hours over two days, delivering a verdict of not guilty. Tears of joy and relief washed over the Waring family. Michael leaned his head back. He was now free to walk away from Pat's murder a horrible crime that dogged him for decades. Michael said, I just want to go home. The Rebholtz family was devastated. They waited almost 40 years for closure and walked away empty-handed. Pat's brother Mel said, There is a higher court than Hamilton County. We truly believe that, and we wouldn't have made it this far if we didn't. Asked if he still believes Michael is responsible for Pat's death, he simply stated, Absolutely. In 59 years, there has never been any closure or justice for Patricia Rebholtz and her family. A senseless act of horrific violence not only took Patricia's life, but destroyed the lives of so many others. Michael's father, Arthur Waring, died of pneumonia at the age of 41, just two months after Patricia's murder. Arthur once told a reporter, It's been a nightmare, and I wish I could wake up and find that it was all a horrible dream. Many residents of Green Hills believe what actually took the life of Arthur Waring was a broken heart. Mr. and Mrs. Mel Rebholtz eventually left Green Hills. There was just too many memories there. They had another child, a daughter, but they never recovered from the loss of Patricia and they later divorced. Patricia's brother, Mel Jr., was a pilot during the Vietnam War. Not only did he bravely serve his country, he never stopped fighting for justice for his little sister. On August 11th of 2003, just two days after the 40th anniversary of Patricia's murder, Mel passed away, never finding the justice he was so desperately seeking. What really happened on August 8, 1963? Did a guilty man walk free, or was he a victim of overzealous police work? What happened to the investigation into the other suspects witnesses saw that night? Did Judge Benjamin Schwartz overstep his judicial powers and prevent the justice that Patricia Rebholt so richly deserved. 59 years later, we are still searching for those answers. Who murdered Patricia Rebholt? If you have any information about the Patricia Rebholt cold case, please contact the Green Hills Police Department at 
825-2101. Thank you for joining us today. If you like this video, hit the like button and please consider sharing the video with a friend, as this is the best way to help our channel grow. As always, we look forward to seeing you in the comments, so make sure to express your opinions on the murder of Patricia Repholtz. Stay well and be safe. Until we see you again with another cold case, this has been Ion Justice.